Welcome to The Big Break Show, a podcast where we discuss short-term rentals, entrepreneurship, life, mindset, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Rob Loza and Jesse Vasquez. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Big Break Show with my co-host, Mr. Jesse Vasquez. And here we are in episode number 17. What's up, Jesse? Number 17. What's up, man? Yeah, today I'm I'm pretty pumped, man. If you If you guys... Are looking to get direct bookings, you're gonna have to listen to Mark Simpson of Ab- Boosley talk about how he was able to build. Dude, this guy lived on a stable, was Airbnb before Airbnb was a thing, actually lived in a rural market and was able to grow his family business. So I'm excited to have him on for everybody to learn about, you know, getting direct bookings. He's the king at that. He's able to put together websites. The dude wrote a book, like he's he's done, he's doing it all, man. Right, Rafa? Yeah, dude. Uh, Mark's been a, uh, he's a legend. I mean, he's, he's like the king of like direct bookings. Um, I picked up his book. I'm, I'm a couple chapters in, uh, he created my website, nightandrain.com, right? K N I G H T A N D R E I G N.com. If you guys want to check out a sample of it, but I'm excited to have him on because we actually went on a very, very good conversation where he talks about how he grew up, how to get direct bookings, the best next actionable step to start getting those direct bookings. And how important it is to actually focus on getting outside bookings from any of these platforms, right? Like the Airbnbs, Verbos, Booking.coms. That way you don't have to rely on one person. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for everybody to listen to this episode. Yeah. And the one of the biggest things is that you can do all this stuff literally for free. Doesn't cost yep. anything. Yep. Literally. So check it out. If you guys want to learn about direct booking, there's a lot of insightful information in here. Appreciate it. And if you guys have any questions, leave a comment below. We always answer them. Without further ado, Mr. Mark Simpson. So, Mark, thanks a lot for coming on the show, man. Really, really appreciate it. I'm excited to have you here. Um, I know we've uh, we've been talking for a while now on Clubhouse, and uh, now we finally get to have you on the podcast. So thanks for coming on. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I've noticed we've all got hats on, caps on, which is, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew go. you guys were going to wear one, so I was like, I got to throw one on too. Yeah. I know. You know what, Mark? That's cool, though. You could be yourself, man. You, you're you're wearing your hat. It's like your brand is... Whenever I see you with your hat on, you know, like that's your brand, dude. It's cool. I like that. You could be yourself. You don't got to be like somebody else. I love that about... Yeah. Somebody once said that to me like way, 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 way long ago when I started Boosley, they were saying about personal brand and whatnot. And it's just never was done on purpose. It's just this is how I like to dress. And if I'm, I'm wearing like... This is just like a H&M shirt and I just put a Boosley logo on it. So here you go. Brand yeah, it. Dude. Brand it. It's cool, man. It's that laid back, just like chill, you know, you're almost like a, like, like a, he's almost like a hipster, dude. Like Mark's a, Mark's a hipster with the boost <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta get me a shirt with my logo. Both of you guys got some cool logos going on. I'm wearing a, uh, I don't know what the, I think this is from like Banana Republic or something. I don't know. Yeah, you got a brand, man. Speaking of brand. So let's talk about that, Mark. What, where, where did you jump in? How did you get started? Like, you know, tell us where you were born. You're obviously, you got a cool accent. Nothing like me and Rafa over here. You know, tell us about your, your life growing up and what that was like and, and uh, where, where you grew up at. So I'm, I'm from the UK. It's a very British accent. It's a bit of a weird accent because I've traveled around a lot. Um, in fact, you know, I've, I've been all over the States, coached a lot of soccer, but well, that's part of the journey. So I, I was actually born on a 200 acre farm in the middle of nowhere in the United Kingdom. So I was, I grew up with, with animals and livestock all over the place. And then at the age of five, my parents transformed the farm, knocked down the barn, put on four bedroom guest house. The reason why is that in the eighties and the nineties, there was a big uh, farming crisis going on and loads of farms were going out of business and they had the foresight to go, okay, we could either fold or we could try something. You we could like pivot which is crazy because in 2020, so many businesses pivoted. And it's just like back then, that's what they did. And, and what they did is they created these four bedrooms. There was no Facebook. There was no Airbnb. There's no booking.com or anything to market. All they literally relied on was newspaper ads and word of mouth. That's it. But the whole farm stay thing back in the 90s, nobody was doing it. And so they were first movers and they, they were rewarded. It was so popular. Uh, it got to a point where I was just so used to seeing strangers in my kitchen every single day just new people in the house every day and i grew up with that and um you know before going to school i would do breakfast and go to school come back and then i'd do evening meal like the restaurant sort of thing at night time at the weekends i'd change beds and do all of that and i just grew up in it i was just like encapsulated with hospitality and then uh sort of early teenagers 
I wanted to do one thing and one thing only, and that was play soccer. Like Liverpool is my team, like Liverpool Football Club is my team. I wanted to play soccer, I wanted to play for Liverpool. I'm just crap at playing football. So that dream was quickly <laughs> evaporated. Fell into coaching, and then that's how I got to the state. So I fell into coaching, got all my qualifications, got all my badges, had an amazing opportunity to go to Tennessee for four months, five months. Went to Tennessee. I like I got the bug. I just kept going back every year. Got my five because you can only get five month visas at a time. So I'd be in the UK for seven months, USA for five months, and every time I was going to a new place, touched down in nearly every state, which was so cool. And then in uh, like fast forward a few years, me and uh, me and my buddy are in a in a pub back in England um, in a in a small little chain pub, and we're like, well, our little hometown's too small for us now. Where do we go next? And we went down to London. So in London, in the big city. Um, started working for Yelp, which is the big review site, doing sales and marketing. Uh, it was called Quipe at the time before it got acquired. And it was there where I learned all about social media. I learned about emails. I learned about review sites. I learned about SEO, all of that jazz. And then in 2011, my parents have still got the business at this point, 2011, 2012. Um, I'm the eldest of four. And they asked if I wanted to come into the business with my wife and, and our eldest. And that was it really from, from there on in for the next five, six years. We just helped them get online because when we were coming into the business, they were still doing everything on pen and paper. It was crazy. So any bookings that came in, any cancellations, they had to rub it out, raise it out, put in the new ones. It was mad. So I got it all online. We got it all online and it worked really well. And, you know, it's, it's um, over those couple of years, we got to the number one ranking on TripAdvisor, which was amazing. Like this is when TripAdvisor was a thing and our Facebook page was the most followed local business in the area. And then in 2016 is when Boostly properly got going. Um, and since 2016, I've been sort of helping host whether it's in the Facebook groups. I've got a Facebook group called the Hospitality Community. That's still going very strong to this day. We do websites, we do coaching, I do podcasts, hence the whole setup going on here, YouTube channels. And now I released a book and it's madness. These last five, six years have been uh, insane. So yeah, really excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And uh, yeah, looking forward to digging into it. Dude, Mark, it's such a cool story, man, because like everything that you said from the beginning, the fact that you transitioned into it, right? But you were around it your entire life from doing what everybody else is doing now because of websites like Airbnb, VRBO, Booking.com. You and your family were doing it with literally like coming up as you went. Like, let's find people, right? There's no website. Now it's super easy for anybody to become a hospitality person, right? Put up an apartment, put up a house, throw it on Airbnb, you're set. But you focus on the best part where you don't have to rely on anybody else, to acquire those, right? How many conversations have we had about so many hosts, such as myself, who rely on only Airbnb for their entire business? And then something like Airbnb shuts them down and then they're they're stuck. What do they do, right? That's where you come in. So I want to bring it back to how did Boostly get started? Like, wh where did that come from? Where wh What struck the idea to go, hey, I want to start this company and why Boostly? Like, where did that, wh where did it come from? So um, funny enough, it's my wife that came up with the name. Um, me and my wife went away for a few days in 2016 and it was about 2016, 2017 where, I mean, our goal with coming into the family business was get it to a point where we could add a couple of zeros on the end and sell it. My parents wanted to retire, you know, they, they wanted to retire to a little nice little seaside town and on all that cool stuff. And so we got it to 2016, 2017, where we had achieved that, you know, we grew, we added on holiday accommodation. We had it on a, a wedding venue. It was the business just grew and grew and grew. And in 2017, me and my wife were like, well, what are we going to do next? So I say 2016, 2017, we went for a few days away and I got my little pen and paper and I was doodling what we could potentially do and thinking about names. And, and I really wanted to help other hosts because I started going to tourism meetings, like meetups in our local area. And it was at these meetings I met other people. When you're so like ingrained into your own business, you just naturally think that everybody's doing what you're doing. And it's, it's so easy to sort of get stuck in your own little world. And, and it was at these meetings and I was chatting to other hosts, whether bed and breakfast owners or hotel owners or rental owners or whatever, property managers. And I was asking them about how they were getting their bookings just out of interest. And they were all bemoaning that we're having to do it on booking.com's terms. And, you know, and they weren't really doing anything. They weren't being proactive or being reactive. And I was just saying, well, you know, are you doing social media? I'm like, nah, are you doing email? No. You're doing Google, you're doing web websites. Like, I've got a website, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I was just like, well, who is actually helping? I went to our local council. I went to our local tourism board and I asked them and they said, well, we're doing things every now and again. And I said, well, have you got anything online? And I'm like, no. So I was just like, the light bulb moment went off. And so 
I created the Facebook group. The Facebook group was just for our local area. It was just for Scarborough. It was just for Whitby. And every day I popped up in there and I was just giving little tips and advice, things that I'd tried and tested, things that had worked. And um, every day just doing that. And then after time, what I noticed was that people were requesting to join from further afield. So from Manchester and Liverpool and in Scotland and in France and Germany. And I was like, what's going on here? And people were recommending this group because there was nothing else out there at the time. And then people from America joined and Australia. And before I knew it, it got to a thousand members. And I was like, well, what, what is going on here? And I just kept every day posting up advice and people started to come to me and people kept coming to me. And I was like, well, there's something here. And it's just when that light bulb moment clicked. And to be honest, I created it because me and my wife wanted to travel again. Before I met my wife, she was born in Johannesburg. She'd been in Egypt for a couple of years and ski season in France. So we're both travelers like to, to an extent. And so we wanted our boys to travel as well. And the reason why we traveled, we created it at the start was that we just wanted to be able to go somewhere and get free accommodation. That was literally it. And then on the backside of that was that people were coming to me and wanting me to actually do a little bit more. And I, I started off by doing one-on-one -on -one work done for you. So I'd go into somebody's booking.com list and Airbnb list and I'd try and go to someone's website or email and I'd just fix it all. But I could only look after so many hosts at a time because it was only me. And I didn't realize about structuring or systems or anything like that. It was just me messing around trying to figure this all out. And then what I realized was that if I went flip from a one-to-one a -one to a one-to-many, I could help a lot more people at a time. So I just created, um, I went on Thinkific, which is like Kajabi, an online training thing like Teachable. And I just recorded everything that I did for like 80 hours worth of stuff. And I just put it all in there. And I went back to the group and I said, listen, I've just created this. I need five people to test it. Um, I'll do it for like a hundred dollars or something really, really low down. I said, I just, I just need your feedback. Five people put their hand up. Those are the first ever people to test the Boostly sort of training. And it just grew from there. We've now got to over a thousand members, hosts all over the world. And uh, just last year, it became accredited because I know what I'm talking about works because it worked for me. And the members and the feedback from the members who did it, they said it was great. But this, I wanted to get it accredited from like an actual governing body. And so I put it in front of this governing body. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And then to get it accredited last year was, was, was amazing. One of the biggest things I've, I've ever done because then it's just lit the touch paper now and so many people are wanting to join and, and be part of it, which is great. Who accredited that? It's called the CPD. Um, it's like a governing body here. Somebody actually recommended me that I should get in touch with them. And, you know, I'm very, very lucky that people in hospitality don't normally get born into it. People come into it or fall into it from other careers. You know what I mean? And so somebody that was part of the Boostly community, they um, had done the accreditation with an old company of, of theirs from another from another sector, and they gave me so many help and advice. So it was amazing. So like, the community community came together and put it in front, and um, yeah, like pfft, couldn't believe it. So yeah, that, that, that's good because then it just gives you that that backing. Because in, as much as the hospitality industry or Airbnb is not regulated, the online training <laughs> sector is definitely not regulated in any way, shape, or form. And so to to be able to go, listen, this is this is what I do. Talk about direct bookings. I teach you X, Y, and Z, and it's accredited. It just gives you that that clout, that trust, you know, which is a which is a massive part of obviously everything that I talk about is that trust factor and, and direct bookings and stuff. So yeah, amazing, really. And so yeah, originally I was going to call it Boost Hospitality. My wife sat at the table with me. And she said, "Just call it Boostly." And there it is Boostly. There it is. Yeah, yeah, it's a really cool name. You know, I actually have a question. It's a little bit off topic right here. Uh, at what age did you go into a pub for the first time and have your first beer? Uh, well, the legal age in the UK is, is 18. So obviously, obviously, the first time. <laughs> first time uh, yeah. Those of you listening right now, Mark is blinking his eye as hard as he possibly can. Yeah, so. I've just got something in my eyes. I've just got something in my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's windy out there, huh? It's windy out there. Yeah. I always, I always figure like people in the, in Europe and the, in the UK, like, you know, you know, legal drinking age here is 21. So it's like, you know, I had my first beer when I was probably like, seven or something actually not seven i was probably i don't <laughs> i was probably like 15 or 16 uh and i hope my kids aren't listening to this and if i only had one beer and i never had one again uh until i was 21 but anyway um i always figure like kids in the uk have like their first beer like they're sitting at a pub and they're just like these like 14 year old kids just like having a beer <laughs> dude that's my my that's what my vision is probably the same way mark that you think of californians all live by the beach like that's not true either <laughs> 
Hey, uh, Mark, I got to ask you a question and, and I don't want to get off topic because I would really want to focus on the direct booking side of things. But something that you said kind of caught my attention, something I've always wanted to do and it's travel. What takes away that fear factor for you to travel to random countries and just kind of experience and live there? Right. Because like even me thinking about I want to fly to the UK and I want to spend some time there, but it's so intimidating because like. How do I know what's a good area? Where do I stay? You know what I mean? Like, do I just pull up Google and find hopefully one of your websites with one of your clients out there and stay at their place? Or is it like, do I need to do research? How do you get that fear factor out of you to say, hey, I just want to pick this country on the map and go travel there for a month? I think it, it definitely becomes easier over time. And, you know, as soon as we had kids, everybody was saying to us, well, that's it. You're not, you know, that's your traveling days over. And, and we were so stubborn. Well, like, now. Nah we can do this. And like the, as soon as, um, or Charlie was, so Char I've got a three boys. I've got Alfie who's nine, Charlie who's six, and I've got Frankie who's three. And Charlie was two. We set off, uh, we, we sold our house in, in Darlington. So we still had the house just, we're coming out of the, uh, being in a family business. We sold our house in, in Darlington, which is in the UK and the money that we pocketed in a profit, we spent three months going to Thailand, Cambodia, Bali and, and, and India. And people are like, you're, you're mad, but it's just, it gets easier with time. And, as, as far as like what to do, how to go and whatnot, when I first started traveling way back when you were literally reliant on um, a Lonely Planet book, you know, those Lonely Planet guys that you used to get, like those are literally what you were going off. But now it's so much easier with social media, with Facebook and, and Instagram. I think the whole world is smaller. And if you, if you, go, if you're landing somewhere now, especially with like what's happened in the last year with, with Clubhouse, we all use Clubhouse. It's been so good for all of our businesses. And it's like now you could just through Clubhouse and Instagram, you could pretty much message anybody, go anywhere and just say, hey, I'm landing here. Where do you recommend? And you could easily just get by from 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 that alone. But if, if like if you don't know anybody, there's, there's Facebook groups, you know, there's so many good resources now, but, but what they weren't where when we just got going. But it was just a case of just doing it. So something that you're really passionate about and you're something you really want to do, you just go and do it. And, and yeah, travel has been a major part of of, of, of my life, my wife's life and, and our boy's life as well. Can I ask you another question in regards to travel here? Yeah, go. What's been the most challenging thing aside from having to figure out how to do it with the kids in terms of traveling around and staying at certain places? Is it, is it like, was it a mentality thing? Was it just, it's something that you've always wanted to do? Was it hard for like, cause I, I mean, you guys have to be able to generate income remotely and now you do it, right? You have your hospitality, you have the Boostly, everything else, but what's been like the biggest actual part aside from figuring out how to do it with the kids? I'm a, I'm a stickler for a routine. Um, I, I love, I do love a routine. And when I'm not in that routine, I, I do sort of miss it. Um, one of the first business books I ever read was, was Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. I'm a massive Tim Ferriss fan. You know, I discovered it in 2016, just as I was creating Boostly, I discovered his podcast and, you know, I definitely sort of fell into that. And when I'm, when we are traveling, that, that routine definitely does go out the window to an extent. What I realized is that if you can't commit to like 30 minutes of summer, just get 10 minutes done, you know, and, and I, and I just sort of adopted that sort of mindset. The, the whole thing about the way that I run Boostly, the, from day one, it was remote. So right now we've got 26 members of staff behind the scenes and every single one of them is remote in some way, shape or form all around the world, they're doing different things and different tasks. And, um, I'm very fortunate that we could be going all over the place. Like we were starting doing this in 2017. So now having a, like a, a remote business, the Dropbox method where in Dropbox, everybody's remote. Like we, we've always done that. So it, to us being remote is not that big of an issue, but it's when you're traveling and when you're moving. So for example, last September, uh, we started our travels back from Spain to England. I'm now back in England. We've bought a house here and we were settled because the, the schooling and stuff all got really, really important for us. And so from the 30th of September to the 1st of November, we were moving around Spain and, and France, just traveling around all the time. And so that was the trickiest because there was no proper routine. But I'm very fortunate that I've built a business that every day I'm trying to sack myself from. <laughs> so every single day I'm trying to figure out um, how ways and means that I can remove myself from the most important part of the businesses and how I can hire amazing people to sort of fill that gap. So the, the more this business goes on, I, I'm about six years in coming up to the more that this business goes on and the, the more I learn and the books that I read, for example, the biggest book I read over the last year and the one that's had the most impact on me is clockwork by Mike McCallowitz. 
run like clockwork. So again, I'm, I, I read that book. I devoured it. I'm now part of the 12 month accelerator because I really want to like get tap into this. And, um, so hopefully like say this time next year, we'll be able to take that, you know, four week vacation and literally everything will just run as smoothly behind the scenes. And, and, and that's sort of where I'm getting to, but yeah, I mean the, the most challenging part right this moment, when we do travel and move around, it is the, the routine aspect, but getting there every single time we do it. You know, the, um, Mike Michalowicz is the biggest factor in my entire business. It's why I systemize it so well. It's, it, I use his entire thing. Um, and so it's funny. I was just having a conversation with someone about this last week, maybe a couple of days ago, I think over the weekend, um, where they go, how do you run your business without having to be there all the time? And I said, you know, I've slowly been working right now. I'm pretty much hands off in the business, but I'm not unreachable. I still have to be reached whenever there's a fire that needs to be put out, whenever there's a major issue that needs to be handled. And I said, right now, my biggest goal for this year is to be able to put the phone down for one whole day where I can be completely unreachable and the business will still continue without me. And um, eventually I want to get to the point where it's two days, three days, and then the entire week. And then I'm no longer at all needed. And I'm just literally 100% completely removed, which is exactly what you just said. It's, it's one of my biggest goals this year. In order to get there, I have to implement certain better systems, better people, because you have to deal with people. And I want to be able to get to the point where I can don't have to rely on certain OTAs, websites, and things like that as well, which leads me to Boostly, right? Can we talk about exactly what you do in terms of like your training, how you help people, like things like that? Yeah, I want to spend. So uh, I guess like my elevator pitch, so to speak, is that I give hosts the tools, the tactics, the training, and the confidence to increase their direct bookings and cut down on their over-reliance on the OTAs. And it, it's it's all stemmed from the fact that um, just as we were coming to the end of our time working in the family business before it sold, I had this absolutely awful guest, the worst guest ever. I mean, you can all now picture your your worst guest. I had that moment and they booked via uh, uh, booking.com, sorry. And they were so bad. I went to them for help and they literally just didn't want to know. They just tre treated me like a number. And where they go online and they talk about partners, you know, I say this when they're comments, you are our partners. And I was just like, you are not. This, we are literally just a number to you. We are just a number trying to facilitate your system. And so the, the way I started this was I started talking about direct bookings. And I'm not the person who created direct bookings or booked hashtag book direct, but I've definitely been like the loudest person talking about it because I know how important it is. And I know how many people are reliant on Airbnb, booking.com, Verbo, et cetera, for their, for their revenue. And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I've done so many of these clubhouse rooms. I've done so many podcasts and webinars and videos over nearly, nearly 500 episodes of the Boostly podcast. And I talk about this all the time and still the kickback is that, um, well, how do you do it? Like, how do you get started? Why should you get started? And I totally get it. Like with, with Airbnb, with, with hospitality, you've said it, Rafa, yourself. It's so easy to get a business, to get a property, take a couple of pictures on, on your iPhone, put it on Airbnb, and you can pretty much be guaranteed revenue. Pretty much be guaranteed revenue. There's no other industry like it, right? I, we do website design. You, you can't have, there's no website I can go and list my services and be guaranteed revenue. I've got to do what every other business owner does and brand yourself, market build a name, et cetera. And you've got to do all of that. But with hospitality, you don't. It's crazy. To be good, you have to do that though. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, yeah. To, to, yeah. <laughs> to, to build it, to build it and to be keep coming back, you've got to be good. Just like anything, you live and die by your reviews. But to get started, it's like so simple. Then oh, yeah. it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it's so easy, but it's a curse because it is so easy. You become reliant and over-reliant. And when you become over-reliant, like Rafa said, Airbnb can shut down your listing for no reason. We've all seen it. We've all heard of it. We were in Facebook groups, we're in Clubhouse. We've seen it happen. You could get a couple of really crappy reviews and just drop off the algorithm, drop off the search. And then if you're so reliant on one platform, that's literally your business done. And I've seen it. Everybody's seen it. Everybody's heard it. Everybody's witnessed it in some way, shape or, or form. And so this is why I do what I do. It's just the biggest kickback to direct bookings is people go, it takes a lot of time, takes up a lot of energy. It costs a lot of money. And I'm just like, it doesn't have to be. Everything that I show and talk about costs zero to do. And time-wise, as long as you systemize and structure yourself properly and the business properly, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And it, it works. It just works 
all the times. And I started doing the training. And after two years, people were coming to me in the group because the website is such a key part of it. The website is like your online business card. And people were coming to me and I was talking about all these things and they were going, well, my website's not working. And I said, well, you know, who did your website? And they said, well, a website designer or X, Y, or Z. They showed me and I was like, well, you, you need to get a, a WordPress website, whatever that is. And they came back to me and said, I, I don't know what I'm doing. My website designer's gone missing. One person said, my website design is now in jail. I was like, okay, that's crazy. And so I started up doing websites. I knew how to put a few things together. I was very fortunate in my time in Bali. Uh, I, met a, I met a British guy called Tom, Tom O'Brien, and, and he came on board and started helping doing websites with me. And now between us, we've grown it from being two people that we helped to now we've got over a thousand hosts all over the world. Rafa being one, we've got websites live and up and running. And you know, we, we just know how to structure a website. We know what works. It doesn't have to be creating the next Mona Lisa. Look at Airbnb. Like, like Design-wise, Airbnb is shocking, but it works because they know exactly what to do, where to put it, how to place it, and how to get a, a booking. And we've just basically taken that. We've looked at what booking.com, Verbo, Airbnb, Marriott, Hilton, all these chains. We look at what everybody does. We've put it in, packaged it up into a little website that is affordable for any host. And and like, that's what we've been literally been doing since uh, 2018 on that one. And it, it just just works. And if you were to break Boosty down into like 100%, 70% of it is website design. That's 70% of our income is, is that. And I'd say 20% is the coaching, the training, the academy. 5% is content creation. So we've got a thing called content creator where we just basically create so many social posts, generic posts that hosts anywhere in the world can use so we don't have to worry about what to post. And then the final 5% is the new thing, which is that, which is the book, the book. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all there and everything is just designed to help people with their direct bookings. Yeah. You know what? I, have, I got a question for you. So were you always like a web nerd or an SEO nerd or did you just like fall into that? Were you always in, you know, on that end? I really enjoy marketing and social media. I loved it at the granary. I love being able to test and tweak things and see what works and what doesn't work. Before that, no, not, not really. I'm, I'm a massive soccer fan. So a Liverpool fan. I was just, I was obsessed with that. That was everything to me. And so I've sort of had to like cut down on that a little bit and and bring this in as well, well as obviously being a father and a, and a, and a husband and stuff and and all, and all that stuff. But yeah, it's just something that I've learned and I've really enjoyed. And, and you know, that, that coaching side of me never left. So now I coach hosts instead of kids, you know what I mean? And, 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 that, and that's why it's called the playbook because it's got an element of coaching and playbook and, and sports and all that in, in, into the book. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's it's something that I'm fascinated with. And the cool thing is, is that it never stagnates. It's always changing and amending. Like right now, it's like, if, it's like TikTok is everything. Where like a couple of years ago, that was Musical.ly. And now people are talking about NFTs and Web 3.0 and, and, and blockchains and all, all these new things that's coming in. So there's always something new to learn. And the cool thing is, is that I've now got the time to devour that and I can just put it into terminology that anybody can understand. Yeah, you know, sales and marketing, Mark are so important to a business and you know, me finally, I, I was in business development and sales and marketing, all that stuff. And I remember you mentioning that too. A lot of that place is such a big role. If you, I always, there's three things that if you can do in a company, sales and marketing, and you're able to have a presence and you talk about TikTok and like YouTube, you're in all these things. Each one of those avenues, those social media streams brings on a different type of client. Like I realized over time, like YouTube will bring on like legitimate clients over time. will watch whatever you're doing and then follow you. YouTube is like, or excuse me, Instagram is like an instant type thing. And TikTok is that too, where you're, you're here today and then you're gone tomorrow, whatever content. So you got to be super, super, um, you know, fluent in those things. So what are you doing right now to grow your business? Like what's, what's the top things as far as sales and marketing aspect are going, you just got a book that you put out, which I haven't, I haven't ordered it by the way, and I'm going to order it. I know broth has got it. Um, so kind of break that down. What's important to you and how you've been able to grow your business. Cause a lot of people watching this now, we know that you're able to put websites together. Rafa's, uh, I think Rafa, you used uh, Mark to put your your site together, mm -hmm. which was awesome, by the way. Mark, great, came out amazing. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it did, it did turn out really awesome. So, what can people do right now, um, to, you know, to get started on that and to, to to for direct bookings? Like, just let's just talk about that for a second, and then I'll go into the sales and marketing stuff. So, what can somebody do right now? That's let's just give a scenario. Somebody's been on Airbnb for the last two years. They're getting bookings. There's money coming in, but there's that other sector. Let's talk about SEO. How important is that? And uh, search engine optimization. That's a Google search. So break that down for us. There's a couple of things there. And the first two parts of the, 
what you asked. It's going to relate to the same thing, but let's just park and talk about SEO for a super quick minute. And then we'll circle back to the, the number one tip, which I think that is going to be important for everybody. So SEO, and, and this is really important to me because it's a, a, a podcast that I just literally recorded yesterday because we're starting to get a lot of these questions come up on, on the phone call. So when people want to have a boosted website, we have a phone call with them to make sure that we're both a good fit. And, the, and the, this question keeps coming up and, they, and I say, well, why do you want to have a direct booking website? If it goes, well, I want to appear at the number one of Google. I said, brilliant. <laughs> How are you going to achieve that? You know, and I, and I show them and I, I wanted to record a video and a podcast showing exactly how hard it is to rank at number one. And even if you can rank number one, how it still isn't at the top of Google. Because when you, when someone says to me, oh, SEO, I go, okay, well, what does SEO mean? And they go search on engine optimization. Brilliant. What does that mean? And you delve down it pretty much. And they just go, and they're just saying it because it's what they heard someone say, or they just, they hear people say, or they just assume that that's what you get with a website. And so SEO, to be perfectly brutally honest, unless you've got the time and the resources, as in you've got somebody that you can hire to do it, or you've got money to put to it, you shouldn't even worry about it. For a, anybody below a hundred units, you shouldn't even be worrying about it, in my perfectly honest opinion, because if you think about SEO and they go, well, I want to rank highly for vacation rental in wherever, vacation rental in Scarborough, vacation rental in San Diego, vacation rental in Pacific Beach, or whatever it may be. And it's like, that's all well and good, but just go put that into Google, put that search into Google. I go right now, put it into Google and see what comes up. The first three to four spots are filled with ads because they're so powerful. And then you've got the map, the big Google map, the Google vacation rental business map. And then you've got the SEO. Look at what's ranking on SEO, Airbnb, the huge, huge websites that have put in millions in this. So before you even get to an independent website for, for a very short tail keyword, a short tail keyword is vacation rental San Diego, for example, you're looking at page two and you know, there's a very geeky sort of SEO phrase that you might as well hide a dead body on page two because nobody goes there, you know? So when it comes to SEO and when it comes to it, the most simplest thing you can do if you want to, to give the Google the juice so it can see you, you should just be number one, blogging, as in writing content for your website. Okay. So don't write content for Facebook or anything like that. write content for your website, put it on there every month, every week. I actually recorded a video showing you how to hire a content content writer for thirty dollars on Fiverr who will write content for your website and how to do it properly, and and that's probably one of my most watched YouTube videos of of, of this year. Mark, hang on a sec. I want I want to cut you right there. Are you talking about doing a blog or are you talking about doing an actual like writing the content, like you know, putting together a blog? Yes, a blog. Okay, yes. cool. Okay, but basically a blog and just writing on your website because it's a it's a lost art. So many people don't do it. So that's one of the easiest ways because all like the Google SEO. Airbnb SEO, booking.com SEO, Facebook SEO, it's all the same. Basically, if you want to appear higher and better or, or whatever, you just got to make sure that you update it. This is why people go on Airbnb every single day, change their images around, change the prices up and down or whatever, because they want to just keep the, the Airbnb juice flowing. And it's the same with Google. You just got to make sure that you've got relevant content updated all the time. And that's literally all that, all that you need to do. And that's literally the most simplest, simplest way. And it's the problem is this is that it's not a quick fix. And we're so impatient now that we literally want the quick fix. Like I want to do this and I want to achieve that in the shortest amount of time because we're just so in impatient. Unfortunately, SEO for 90% of the people that I speak to, it's not relevant for them because SEO is a, is a medium to long-term game. So let's bring it back to the other thing we said about what do I attribute to the growth of Boostly? What do I attribute to what should every host be doing with Dara Bookings? And this is what, what I've done. And I've done it at the family business with the granary and I've done it with Boostly. And it, and this is what I now talk about a lot in this as well. It's relationships and partnerships, relationships and partnerships and the network that you can, you can create. That is hands down the easiest, bestest, simplest, cheapest way that you will grow your business in 2022, 2023 is how you've always grown it. Because there's, a, there's that very cliche saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And, and that's more present. The good thing is, is that now it's so easy to achieve that with social media, with Clubhouse, with Facebook groups and, and B&I meetings and all of those cool things. So it's how can you grow a local network of business owners that 
if you want to go down the route of hospitality, so short stone rental accommodation owners, can you build a little network of people that you, if your property is full, somebody messages you for an inquiry, whether it's direct or through other, and you can go, yep, yeah, sure. And then you go and contact that host that you've got a little WhatsApp group with accommodation that's very similar to yours. And you say, listen, I've got this for you. All of them, it's the booking. And then you pass the booking on and you get a little kickback from it. These are sort of the little networks that you need to be building partnerships, relationships that will help your short-term rental business get direct bookings, which is, which is like, which was part one. And the other thing is about how has Boostly grown. What I'm doing now is my role at business at Boostly is to continually, I guess, like business development manager. I'm always reaching out to other people, reaching out to people in the industry, whether it's vendors as in guesty, hospitable, um, whoever it may be, and just sort of getting them to know me, getting to know Boostly, getting to know what we're doing, showing what we're doing with the websites. Because this technology, this new technology we've created with our websites recently, nobody else has done. And so hospitable and guesty and everybody wants to know more about it. So we're, we're basically creating partnerships that way. And that is how I'm bringing in um, tons and tons and tons of awareness to Boostly without spending any any money on ads. I don't spend money on Facebook ads. I don't spend money on Google ads. I instead put that budget and put that money to, to other things. So that's what I'm doing. I actually was part of, I saw part of the, the webinar that you did with Hospitable. Was it yeah. last week, two weeks ago, something like that? I saw part I of it and it was really yeah. good. Um, yeah, it was it was recent, right? It was it was like a week and a half ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but very recent. And we talked about that. We touched upon that as well because that was one of the questions that came in. It's like, what is my number one tip right now to bringing in direct bookings in 2022? And I went a full deep dive. So if you're part of the hospitable training, part of the community, you've got that big webinar to go check out on that one. Yeah, I've actually been intending to go back to watch it. I just haven't had a chance to. Um, let me ask you a question. I, you know, I actually wanted to bring up a point about how we were talking about earlier um, about relying on Airbnb. So it just happened to me. They took down two listings in the last month and I was pissed um, and it wasn't even my fault. Just bad guests complained about something they weren't happy about. And they decided to say without even asking, they're like, hey, it looks like a safety concern. Send us an image to make sure it's not safe and then we'll bring it back up. I got them back up. But it took about a week and a half of me having no listing down, which is what really makes me go as you grow, because now that I'm growing, right, I have so many units now, I actually need to focus on something outside of this stuff. And I want to say like 10% of my bookings come from direct bookings already just from relationships I've built in the past and from collecting information from my other bookings. Um, but I've never done anything like I actually just got an inquiry. I've never done anything like the website is what I was going to say until you came, well, I had a website with Logify, but I'm sure you know those are terrible. And so till, till I got your website, it's funny, just two days ago, out of nowhere, I got an inquiry and I'm like, cool, I got an inquiry through the website. And I had no, like, you know, I don't push it yet because we're still waiting for the API connection and everything to happen. So I'm like, okay. But once I have the website, let me ask you, Mark, like me being part of your network and being part of Boostly now, What's the next step once you have the website live? Like, how do I really push it? Do I have to send out like an email blast to like my emails that I have saved up? Aside from the what you just gave right now with the BNI and everything else, um, and and meeting people everywhere I go now. So like, can I see your listings? Yeah, nightandrain.com. Oh, hey, what do you? It's never like I posted up a picture on on Instagram and somebody messaged me saying, "Hey, you should put your Airbnb link up here so that people can book." And I'm like, "No." I was like, "Go to nightandrain.com if you want to book." Why would I want to push Airbnb? Yeah. Well, this is it. You're you're finally now confident to send somebody to your website and that it will work. And that's the whole difference is that before when you had the free website from said PMS, you were never that confident. But now you can say, right, go to nightandrain.com and you are confident that they will have everything in place and all the buttons are in the right locations that where they will get an inquiry or they'll, or they'll want to book, you know? And, and this is this is the whole thing about why I started doing this is that now someone's confident. Like I say my, my elevator pitch, the tools, which is websites and content creation, the tactics, which is the academy, the training, which is the academy, but most importantly, the confidence to go and increase your direct bookings. And the confidence is a major part. And so it works on two ways, confidence from the host that their website looks good and will work, but confidence from the guest, confidence that when a guest lands on that site, number one, they know you're reputable, reputable, know that you're an actual business. Number two, they know that you've got social proof, which you do on your Boostly website. And everyone go check out nightandrain.com. It's right there. You've got re reviews on there. It's super simple. It talks about why they should book direct, you know, the benefits that, you know, it's, everything is laid out and, you know, we, we haven't reinvented the wheel. All we've done is we've looked at what Airbnb, booking.com, Verbo, Google to an extent, 
Google business list into an extent, Hilton, Marriott, and some big chains. And we've just seen what they're all doing because they spend millions researching this. And I've just basically picked, put it together and then boom, there you go. It's a website, very, very low cost website compared to what the thousands or hundreds of thousands of whatever they pay for their website. And it's available to all. And that's why we did it. So now you've got the confidence to send it to there. So you can send an email blast. You can be at the supermarket, right? And you can be at the supermarket or be at the coffee shop and you could overhear in like some healthcare workers chatting or or ever saying, oh, I need a place to stay. And you can go, hey, here's my business card, nightandray.com. Give us, check it out. Look at the properties. Give us a call if, if you want to make an inquiry. And, and that's it. It's the confidence. Okay. Let me ask you another question in regards to this then, right? The guest, he's, I'm confident. I have a great place. I have a great website where they can go check it out. Somebody just asked me this at this meetup we had this weekend. He goes, hey, I saw you have your own website. I'm like, yeah, you know, and obviously I told him I got them from you. And um, he goes, but what, what, how do you deal with like the safety, right? How do you know that the person that's going to book is a good guest? Because that th their concern was, what if I get someone that, I, you know, their thing is, oh, well, Airbnb is trusted and they vet people. And it's like this, like, I don't know if it's a misconception or not, because they do vet, but they do they really vet? Like, I've gotten really bad guests on all platforms. So to me, it was like, I'm just going to treat it like a regular person if it was a guest who came in through Airbnb, but what's your like advice? And when somebody asks you, well, how do you deal with, like, how do you know if this is a safe booking for me to bring onto my property? If it came from my website through like Google or something. You, you've hit the nail on the head. It's like, it's all it is, is good marketing from Airbnb. That's literally all it is. In 2016, Joe Gebbia, co-founder of Airbnb, did a TED talk. You can go find it on YouTube. And the whole TED talk was about how Airbnb is built on trust. So in 2016, they had a huge struggle. They were the underdogs to Booking.com and Verbo. So the Booking's Holiday Group and the Expedia Group, which owns all of these sites, they had a massive uphill battle to get on at least a par with them. And they had to do trust on two ways. Number one, they had to go and get a community of bookers, guests, to use their platform instead of other places. And they had to get a community of hosts to, to trust to list on there. So they've built everything on trust. And they've done that with amazing marketing teams talking about hiring, right? They've hired some really good people that's got them from here to here, where now you can argue that they are in 2022 above Airbnb, sorry, above booking.com, above Verbo, and they've, they've smashed that. And for, for us as a host, as in talking about direct bookings, we have got all of the tools available that Airbnb talk about air cover and all that jazz. You know, we have got that. There's amazing companies now that are helping hosts when it comes to direct booking. So you've got Superhog, superhog.com. They are guest verification service. It just latches onto hospitable, latches onto all of the PMSs. And it what it does is it gets the guests to verify who they are, right? And you've then got insurance companies now that are, are um, dedicating their services and branches of their, of their business to short-term rentals, vacation rentals. So again, you've got air cover, so the, the, the $2 million, whatever. It's the same with, with Superhog and Gadhog. There's two really good ones right there. And Wavo. Yeah, there's loads. I mean, I'm just, that, that, that's just two that's come to mind. There, there are tons. Like now at the moment in about, you know, now, right now, if you were to ask a host, which PMS or property management software they're using, you ask 10 people, they'll say nine different answers. It'll get to a point in a couple of years time where you ask somebody that, and we, before I even finish the sentence, they'll give you lots of different variations because there'll be loads of people coming into this into this industry. So the trust factor, 100% is there. And like you said, just because a guest is booked on Airbnb and they, yeah, one person may be verified, it doesn't mean that they got three or four people in their party that aren't and they cause a, lo a load of trouble. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's just really good marketing from, from Airbnb. And I've only realized this in the last year and a half since being on Clubhouse, like listening in on the rooms that we're all part of, you know, the lunch and learn on a Thursday and all those other ones that we're part of. I listen to so many Americans and Canadians talk and I realize how much brainwashing has gone on from Airbnb because they don't realize about these things. And that's when I just unmute my microphone and I just say, hey, super hot, guard card, whatever, there's loads of them out there. Just, just. Can I tell you guys something? I actually opened five different accounts with my same ID on Airbnb. I have five different names, five different. I could book five different properties on Airbnb. Literally, I'm not kidding you. Like I, I did that. It's funny, Jesse, that you say that because I literally was just trying that this week and I was like, I wonder if they actually vet this stuff. And I literally just started a new account.
And I'm like, I'm going to put my same exact info and see what happens. And so far, it was two days ago. I haven't heard anything back yet, but I was waiting to see if I heard back. It was funny that you say that. I've been verified with five accounts with five different names with my one single ID that says Jesse Vasquez. Dude, can you guys believe that? Like literally different names. I pick names that are from, you know, random names that you would. Brad Pitt was one of my names I put on there. And guess what? I got verified for, for my freaking ID. Like, dude, there. I don't even want to get, I, I'm getting upset <laughs> talking about this because we're owners of businesses. We're relying on these big, huge, multi-billion dollar companies to be able to vet people. And if they can't do that, dude, like it's never going to, it's never going to be able to be done the right way. Like, you know, that's why you should be direct booking. That's why you should be cutting those service fees out. You should be ca ca causing yourself to not have to pay certain management fees. And that's why I think it's important because at the end of the day, we're think we think we're safe as a host or as an owner of a property with these big OTAs. We're not. Literally, I have five accounts. You know, Jesse, it's it's funny. And and Mark, tell me if I'm wrong here, too. You might have a little bit more uh, experience in this. But on Airbnb, I've gone both sides of the spectrum where people who are not verified have booked my place and stay with me. And then it ends up sometimes it's being good. Sometimes it ends up being bad. But I've also had it where really good hoes, I mean, uh, accounts can't book with me. Right. They have like 25 star reviews and they just can't book with me because either they're young or they got red flagged. I really think it's just an algorithm that picks and chooses randomly, because how can you block someone who's got a really good rep on their own platform and then allow someone who's just brand new, who doesn't know what the hell they're doing or even how to use the platform? It's, it's, it's like Facebook. Now, Facebook has grown so much. Facebook is all bots. Like I lost my Facebook account I had since 2006 last year. It got locked out. And I couldn't get back in for whatever reason. I couldn't get back in. And there's nobody I could communicate with. There's nobody I could chat to. It was just bots. And I lost it. I lost all my pictures, lost all my connections, everything gone. Now you relate this to Airbnb. If I had just relied on Facebook to grow my business, January 2021, I would have disappeared. I would have lost a lot. But from day one, what I did is I made sure that I grew an email list. I grew an email list. I grew a contact list. I grew my list. So the day that my account was locked out on Facebook and I couldn't get back in and bearing in mind, I have Facebook groups. I've got the hospitality community group. I was able to get back in, send an email out saying, Hey, you know, my account's locked out. The group is fine. Don't worry. Um, cause I had paying members with a Facebook group because that's the Facebook is the best place to build a community. I've tried so hard to use Slack and Discord, and it just does not work for whatever reason to build a community. But I was able to get back in. I created a brand new account, able to get back in, and I sent an email out, sent um, my uh, text message list out, and everybody was cool. They knew they knew what was going on. If not, if I'd have just disappeared, I'd have had a shitstorm to deal with. And so that's the that is the important part of it. You just substitute what I just said about Facebook. That is Airbnb. Just imagine getting locked out of your Airbnb. All of your guests, they're freaking out. But by building an email list, by having a property management software tool, by having these things in place, your business is going to survive come three, four, five. Like you said at the start, Jesse, you, anybody can get started, but you've got to be good to be able to survive. That's a key part of it. But then you've got to be able to be a proper business owner to, to be able to survive as well by building a list and doing all of the things. Mark, you said something exactly. One second, Jesse, it's crazy. This actually happened to me as well. And I forgot about it until you brought it up right now. Um, about a year and a half into me doing this, my entire account, um, one of them, luckily I had two accounts on Airbnb. One of them got completely blocked out. They just took it down. It disappeared. And we had seven properties on that one account. And I'm like, what happened? Right. And we're calling them. Turns out it was an Airbnb glitch, an Airbnb glitch that just shut down a bunch of accounts. They were bringing my accounts back. They brought it back eventually, but all my reservations were gone. And you know, the best part is I did it with tech. I've been doing this from day one. I had everybody's information. When somebody books, I save their number, phone number, name, email. And I also asked for theirs in case the one on their account's different. And all I did was this was, it was really simple. I didn't even panic. I just said, Hey, let's get everybody on, get everybody on the line, say, Hey, the account got taken down. They said it's a glitch. Reservations are going to continue as normal and make sure that we save all the future ones that were booked as well because we had that data, right? We had it. We save everything on a spreadsheet. Like I have like 5,000 something uh, list of emails and phone numbers. And because of that, I literally saved every single one. It was like a total of like 16, 17 reservations, but that's a lot, right? It's a lot of reservations. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And, um, and the best part is I ended up converting those to direct bookings. 
right? And at that time, I didn't even know what direct booking were. That's how I actually got into like, oh, wait, we can do this ourselves outside of this. I created a Stripe account. I created a PayPal account, all of that. And I started collecting info. And that's when I was like, okay, this is really, really important. I never focused on it as much from there till now anyway. And I completely had forgotten about that. So just now that you brought it up, I was like, that's right. That actually did happen. Um, and again, we got it back up and everything was fine. And I think the reason why most hosts as well stick to like relying on websites like Airbnb is because Airbnb done a really good job is making us like just, what is it, complacent? Like just like they do the hard work for us, right? There's no reason for me to do anything else if they're doing all the hard work until they actually go, hey, we're in charge. We do whatever we want. They just snip you on the butt and then they leave you hanging. People are going to change that that sort of mantra and methodology of like, well, I will just leave it to Airbnb. The more people come into this and the more this isn't regulated, the more and more and more and more and more people will be like, I'll just wait for Airbnb booking to come in. But then the more people that come into it in your in your area and all of a sudden your listing's not on page one anymore or page two or page three, it's like it's not showing anywhere. Then you'll be like, oh shit, yeah, I have to do something now. I have to be fancy. I have to actually, you know, look after my listing. I have to do this marketing thing that everybody talks about. Because like I say, it's, it, we 2019 was probably the last peak year that you could literally just go take a couple of pictures on your iPhone and then just put up on Airbnb and boom. Now, coming out of it, you, you can't do that. You've got to be able to cater. You've got to be able to do things and market your business. Do guerrilla tactics. You know, someone, some, someone said you do a lot of guerrilla tactics. Be a guerrilla. Do it. And, and the cool thing is it doesn't cost any money. It's absolutely free. And everything I literally talk about is is in this book. I guarantee you for $20, you will get a return of your investment if you just take one of those tactics and put it into practice. Because there's so many cool things. Yeah. You know, Mark, you said something. We were just talking about this in the last podcast. You know, I, I was talking about how before back in the day, you can have like four walls, a room, a TV, and you'd kill on Airbnb. And like, you can't do that anymore. You can't take pictures like that. You have to professionalize what you're doing. You can't, uh, you know, you just can't throw a listing up anymore. There has to be so much. There has to be branding behind it. There has to be, you know, guest reviews. Like I, I, I believe in Superhost. Like, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? Do you think Superhost status matters, or do you, do you, do you not care about that very much? Well, since you're direct booking, we're talking about Airbnb right now. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's fine. I mean, I think one of the big misconceptions of me is that with what I talk about, I mean, I encourage everybody to go cold turkey on the OTAs. Everybody thinks I'm saying like, get rid of your OTAs, cancel your listings. No, you cannot do that. It's, it's as dangerous to go 100% direct bookings as it is to go 100 OTA. Our family business, don't forget, middle of nowhere, middle of the countryside, 200 acre farm, nowhere rural. around us. Rural, so rural. Mm. We needed booking.com to put us on the map for international guests and other people around us, but we never over relied on them. We have always had a healthy 50-50 part, like sort of booking. So 50% through third parties and 50% direct. And then over time, we were able to grow that. But we never went 100%. It's it's so key to have a healthy balance. So it's, it's, it's all about moderation. It's just like anything. If you want to lose weight, if you want to quit drinking, it's moderation. It's, you can't just go cold turkey. And talking about SEO, talking about super host, talking about all those sort of things, I mean, for me personally, Superhost is 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 not what it was when it first came out. Just like what Premium Plus is, it's not what it was when it first came out. For for me, it's just a, they send the notifications out because people get super excited when they hit Superhost and then they go and post about it on Instagram and social media. Whenever they do their round of Superhost and they message people, the amount of stories I see of people saying, "Hey, I hit Superhost," they're doing that not to celebrate you. It's a branding play. If I could, and if I could be asked, and if I had the time, I would create a Boostly Superhost equivalent. And every quarter, I would send it to everybody part of my community because then they'll go, yes, and then they'll post about it on their stories. And the Boostly logo is littered for stories for 24 hours, and it's the same. It's why Booking.com, every single year, they send out the certifications and say, congratulations, you're on 9.8 on your whatever. It's not for you because what then happens is they send the certification out in a post and the host sticks it on their wall and they are branding booking.com in their, in their property 24 seven. And it's just like, it's just, it's just a very clever branding. That's, that's all it is. It hasn't got the same benefits or anything like that. And when people lose it, they lose their shit, but it's, it's no, you just, you just gotta just to, I'd much rather you put that time and attention to get reviews on a Google My Business listing or a Facebook page or a Trustpilot page, something that you can see outside of one channel. Like the Google Business listing is probably more important to get reviews right now than it would be on 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 like one singular platform. Yeah, get one or two, but don't go balls out. Yeah. 
I think, see, I, for me, the Superhost used to be easy like to get that. And now as you start adding, you know, we're, we're at 16 or 17 listings, roughly, you got a bunch of them. It's way more difficult now in different part, different parts of the, you know, we're, we're, we're not just in central California where we have places all over the place. So it, it gets difficult, but like for me, I guess maybe cause I started so long ago in 2015 that I, I feel like it's important, but every operator has a different mindset when it comes to Superhost. You know, I've, I've talked to a bunch of people who are like, ah, who cares about Superhost? It doesn't matter. But for me, it's just like a cleaning situation. It's like, that's all those things that come together. It's not even about the branding necessarily for me. I guess now that you're bringing it up, I think about it in those terms. But it's just the, you know, being able to communicate, you know, and the more properties you have, the more difficult it is. And I'm seeing that now, you know, in real time. So just very quickly, at the end of the day, if somebody is really desperate for accommodation, they go, when they run their search on Airbnb, the first thing they do is they hit the map. So they, they go, right, I'm on, I want to look for a property in Pacific Beach. I want to go from the 1st of April to the 4th of April. They run the search. They say, right, I've got two adults. They run the search and then they hit the map because they need to be in a specific location to where they're going to be if they're an event. I do that. So you look at the map, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't care at that stage if they're a premium plus Airbnb super host or anything. There's location. And then obviously it then kicks in. Are you, is your first image, is that unique selling photo, the USP, is that spot on? Does that draw the attention? Does that get the click? Has it got the emojis? You've got like eye-catching things in to get the click. Once they go onto your listing, how are your first six pictures? What's your description like? You know, and, and then they go down those routes. I think me personally, the last thing that I look at is, 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 is that super host, but that's just me. I can't speak for the whole world of Airbnb just on my preferences because I, I know what I'm, I'm looking for. The, 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 I did a, a, a little, uh, I call them boostly tune-ups where I look at people's Instagram account, Instagram, Airbnb listings, just to give them a little bit of help and advice. I was doing a tune-up today and what I noticed the first six pitches, really clever, um, had the branding of their business in the bottom right-hand corner, just a little watermark on each one. And what that said to me, and when I told them in their feedback was that that's really clever because what you're then showing, number one, to the future potential guest, you're a proper business, you're a brand, but they also then can go and Google search you. They can go, right, I'll Google search you. And again, I say this to everybody, you've got a profile on Airbnb. You don't get a profile on booking.com. You don't get a profile as from what I, from what I know on Verbo, but on, the profile is super customizable on Airbnb. You can put a 400 character bio. It's, it's, it's absolutely madness that people start off that first line of their bio going, hi, my name is Mark. I live in da, 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 da. That needs to be, that first line needs to be about your business, who you are, uh, as in where you're, where you're located and just say, check out my reviews online. They're really good because you're telling them to go do a search on. on if, if Airbnb sees that your logos on a picture, they'll take you off that. They'll take you off. I've had that happen to me. So, um, I think it's one of them as in, they got rid of your account. They took the listing down or did they give you a one? They took the listing down and I got a note from uh, Airbnb saying that I can't have any direct business affiliation on the photos. It's almost like a website. So I had to, I had to take that off, but that was after I filed a complaint. I actually filed a complaint about a guest and that's when they went in and saw that. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop you right there because this is huge. Okay. I have so many thoughts on what we're talking about. Number one, I want to go back to the super host, but two, talk about what you said, Jesse. It's one of those things, like I said before, with the bad guests and the good guests, it's a hit or miss situation. I've gone only taken down when I've complained about a guest because look, I've been asking for email addresses and phone numbers on the messaging for years. And I've never gotten a complaint, not one time. And other hosts go, well, I get taken down after the first couple of times. And I'm like, well, what happened? Well, because this happened with the guests. So they have to go back in and actually go through it. It's a hit or miss situation. Same thing with the photos, right? If you, it's, if he's saying watermark, if it's big and obvious, and then you have an issue and then an actual rep has to go through it. And then they realize that you're breaking the law or their rules about one specific issue. It's their way of saying, Hey, we don't care about what happened with the guest. We care about the fact that you're doing this now. Literally, it's happened to me hundreds of times. This is how I got both listings taken down. It was a complaint about a guest, and they found a different way to complain about me, right? Either the guest or the actual Airbnb rep. And they said, Except hey, the rep. Yeah. yeah, we understand that you're upset about this guest, but let's talk about your actual breaking the rules on our platform here. That's what's happened every single time. There's a, a motto that I've like sort of lived and died by with this Boostly business for the last five, six years. It's, it's beg for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission.
And the rules, same rules apply there. It's happened to me, you know, like we'll have Airbnb messages and saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing that or, you know, da, 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 da. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I literally and, and didn't realize I'm so sorry, Mr. Airbnb. And then you just change it. And then, you know, you beg, beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. That's it. I've gone out of so many situations with them. I'm like, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I have no idea we couldn't do that. I've been doing this for years and I had no idea. And they're like, no worries. Just don't ever do it again. Right. I want to touch on this before we transition to our questions here that we ask everybody, Mark. But I wanted to talk about um, my thoughts behind Superhost because me and Jesse argue about this all the time. Right. I'm not a Superhost. I'm not ashamed to say it. I, we, I just talked about this at the meetup on Saturday we had. I feel that the Superhost status is a way for Airbnb to have control of you and for them to be able to say, hey, you have to meet these standards. And if you don't, we're going to penalize you. I've seen so many people go, oh my God, I'm going to get a bad review by this guest. I have to give him money back. And it's like, dude, why? Because if I get a bad review, I'm going to lose my super host status. But it's costing you hundreds of dollars on the backside, right? I'm not a super host because I'm at a 4.78. I literally checked when they brought it up on Saturday. Why aren't you a super host? I'm at 4.78. I have 2,600 reviews, right? I get, it's impossible to keep everybody happy. One one star is going to take 50 something five stars to get out of, right? I know because I've done the math in the past. I don't remember the exact number, but I did it just to figure it's it out. It's pretty rough to get a when one I start, star. When I started focusing on this, I really, I did a lot of work behind it. And I was like, well, what does it actually do? What does it actually mean? I got all philosophical about it. And I realized, you know what? It really doesn't mean anything. It, there's no extra help. You get a faster, you get a faster line. They give you a phone number to, to talk to somebody directly. But aside from that, there's no actual help. They treat you the exact same as any other person. You still have to wait in line for them to get to your case. You still have to get the same amount of help, depending on the rep. It's not like you get a specialized super host rep. They don't care. Aside from that, on the backside, it really is just them saying, hey, you have to meet these standards in order for you to look good on our website because we've promoted it so much that now some people think, look, when I lost super host, I was like, oh my God, like my world's going to. And then literally 10 minutes later, I got like 25 something bookings. I mean, exaggeration, right? But it didn't stop. I continued to get bookings. I still am always at about an 86 to 90% occupancy, always. And I'm not a super host, right? My listings are still awesome. I still provide the same service. If you go into my, my, in my profile, you're going to see maybe 55 stars and one, one star, right? And that one star is always like this one guest who's like, oh my God, I wasn't happy with the service because they happen to be somebody who just, you're not going to keep happy. I think the cool thing is as well is that you're collecting all the data as well. So if it, for whatever reason, if you know your, your your listing just dropped off the search, all you need to do, you've got all the emails, all the phone numbers, you just send up, just literally hire somebody or spend a day WhatsApping everybody and going, hey, thanks so much for staying with us. It's, it's Rafa. I'm just checking in from that. Right? By the way, do you know anyone that's coming to, to, to the area? Do you, do you know anyone that needs accommodation? You send that out a hundred times, I guarantee you'll get people coming back to you. And then if, if they go, oh, I'm not, and then they say, well, that's okay. But do you mind like putting a little post up on social media or whatever? Just think about us next time you come in or do you know anybody? It's so powerful, especially Jesse, when we, we obviously talk about healthcare professionals, business guests, you know, furnish finder, we're talking about this. They are the best people to send that message to, because I guarantee if they've come into the area and they've been on business or work with somebody else in their office or their company or their network, that is going to be in the area and they're the best people to sort of reach out to because either they book their stay if it's a business or corporate guest or they've got somebody in the company accommodation specialist a pa who's done it for them you get their name you get 10 of those you'll be booked out constantly with direct bookings and you never have to worry about airbnb super host or all that shite again is there a way to automate that message thing or does it just have to be like somebody manually send that message like is there a program out there where yeah, you can automate yeah, it no, no there is um many chat uh, dot com. Many chat is, is one that, that, that uses text messages. There's loads of cool technology. Uh, StayFi. StayFi are doing that now. Text messaging. Uh, StayFi, which is the, the router that you put in your property. Yeah, I have it on some of mine. Yeah. SMS is now activated. Um, I got the email from them. So that's cool. There's so many cool tools available now. It's ridiculous. So it's, it's, and it's like everybody assumes that this technology is only available to the big hotels, the, the Las Vegas hotels, you know, but it's not now it's available to, to anybody from one property and above, which is so cool. And it's so exciting for me, the more that I can sort of dig into this and sort of, and sort of help and stuff. So uh, yeah, I mean, me personally, I'd be doing it manually. Me personally, I'd be looking up that big Google sheet that you've got and I'd be doing a little 80, 20 rule. I'd look at the 20% of guests that brought in 80% of the revenue 
because that means they did big bookings and I'd be calling them. I'd be picking up the phone and I'd be calling them. I'd be also as well putting the, this is why I don't spend any money on Google and Facebook ads is because I invest in lumpy mail. So I love to send stuff in the post, gifts in the post, whatever, swag in the post, whatever it may be, Amazon, whatever in, in the post, because getting something in the post is a lost art now. When you get something in the post, you instantly feel like good, something nice. And if it's and as long if it's not a bill or an invoice, even better. So I'd much if there's somebody that I really want to get in front of, and I and I shared this tip with a host in Spain. He had a little guest house, a hotel that was near a big racetrack. And he wanted to get into the events companies that were sending people from all over Europe to this events track. And what we did is we identified four offices. One was in Germany, two were in Holland, and one was in Spain. We got the name through LinkedIn, easy. We got the address, mailing address, and we just put together a little bundle, cost them about $20, $30 each, $20, say, to, to like track and trace it. And they went in. On the back of that, uh, a lot of phone calls. And because we had a notification the moment it arrived at the office, popped in a call in straight away, hey, it's calling from here. Yep. And then on the back of that, two big meetings, and now they've got contracts set up. So again, $100 investment, $120 investment, a little bit of time. And you're in then. Once you're in and you pass the gatekeeper, you're in. It's so powerful to be able to do. You sound like a you sound like a business development manager, man. That was like that was literally what my job was in the past. <laughs> literally, man. Like that's what I did all day. I would just buy people shit and connect with them on the phone or through an email. And it, that's such an it is a lost art. It's so important. And that's why I think you're doing that now. Your job now in your company is a business development manager, literally. And I don't think a lot of people sometimes don't realize that. Um, Mark, we're also coming up on the hour and I do respect your time. Actually, I wanted to ask you a question before I, before we jump into the, the roughest segment here, where we talk about, you know, the examples and stuff. W when you were writing your book, did you have a ghostwriter? Not a ghostwriter, but I had an editor. So not a ghost. I got an so editor. Did you, did you write yourself or did you, did somebody come in and like really edit? Or, I mean, are you, are you, are you a professional writer at all by any chance? And I'm, the only reason why I'm asking this is because I always hear people talking about writing books. Like I'm not the best writer. Like I can't even, I can't spell like ask me how to spell a word. I don't know how to do it. Uh, thankfully <laughs> autocorrect does that. But like, so how did you do that? How did you articulate that? So number one, I, um, I went on a course cause I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to talk about. I wanted it to be like tools of Titan by Tim Ferriss. So tools of Titan, Tim Ferriss, for those who don't know, he got 200 episodes of his podcast and he basically did the best of best of guests and put it on into a book. And that book isn't one that you pick on page one and you you, you, you stop at page four, read to page 400, you, you dip in and out. Is it, are you talking about Tribe of Mentors? No, Tools of Titan. Tools of Titan. Okay, I haven't read that one. Tribe of Mentors is the next one. Tools of Titans is 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 that one. Um, it's It was such a profound effect on me, that bit book. And so I, I created Boost, this book direct playbook to be exactly the same. It's one that you you do. So I knew how I wanted to do it. I just didn't know how to start. So I went on a course, um, cost me about $1,000 to do. And that course was amazing because it gave me like the – the accountability and the kickstart to get going. At the end of the day, to write the book, they just tell you to do Pomodoro techniques. So 25 minutes on, five minutes off. Don't even look at what you're writing. Just dump it on. And I dumped it onto Google Docs. And then that process took me about six weeks to do. It was last January, just as I was getting into like big onto Clubhouse, doing 24-hour Clubhouse rooms and all of that stuff. I got COVID and then I wrote the book. I literally, I remember it from last January to last March. And then I met the most amazing person called Neely Khan. She's a copywriter, a storytelling copywriter based in the UK, but she helps businesses all over the world, uh, hospitality businesses with, with their copy. And sh she had edited the book in the past. And I said, can you help? She went, yeah. She took it. She took all of my words. I did 50,000 words and she took it and she, she crafted it into a, in, into a story. And then it was just loads of like re-edits and looking at it. And then it, and then it was finished about August. And then from there, it was a case of, going to the publisher, getting the covers, doing the audio book. And then I had it ready for the 2nd of, of February. So it was, uh, it was, it was a long old process, but it was, it was an amazing process. Were you transcribing that or were you actually writing it out? Uh, so what I did was I bought an iPad pro with the keyboard. Didn't have any apps on there, just Google docs. So I had totally no distraction all on a Google doc, um, on my iPad pro, just typing away, tap, tap, tap. So you're actually typing because a lot of people are like doing that now where they're dictating. It's almost like, you know, they're putting all these notes together, but it's just voice. Yeah. Yeah. I know a few people are doing that, but yeah, I, I did that. 
I mean, there's so things, so many things I, I, I would do differently, but that's one thing that I, I would not change was, would be that. Just mainly because these dictator, this, these dictator things never understand my weird accent. <laughs> Such a mad. <laughs> yeah, I got a lisp, and they never understand mine either. So uh, <laughs> I feel you on that, <laughs> dude. Mark, it's crazy listening, talking to you, man. We do so many things similar. I love Pomodoro techniques. I use them all the time. It's how I stay focused when I'm doing actual deep work, right? Like reading the book Deep Work, right? Tim Ferriss is. A, I'm a huge fan, right? His books are awesome. I, it's the only books I ever go back to, maybe once a year, once every six months, and I reread, right? Um, I, I'm I'm actually literally just finished again the four hour work week because i hadn't read it in like a year and a half and i was like i gotta again i just put it on audible this time but it's crazy the stuff that we do i have the ipad and i deleted all the apps because every time i'm working on it i hate when the notifications start popping up and you're just like attention goes from here to there and it's gone what you're doing is gone right so it's crazy man here's a fun thing about these notifications they're red because they because they realized the people who created these and branding people they realized red is the, the one that grabs the attention so it's, it's weird. Every single thing from every single one of these devices is designed to grab your attention. Uh, Simon Sinek is somebody that I absolutely adore. I, I've read and listened and watched so much of his. And he talks about this in detail. Cal Newport talks about it in so much detail as well. And this is the cool thing for me is that when the book was released, my book went to the, the best seller in the entrepreneur category. And number two was Simon Sinek. I was like, this is amazing. So Tim Ferriss is down there. Mike McCallowitz is down there. You know, Simon Snake and my little book, my Boostly book was just number one. It was, it was there for about a couple of days. It went back down, but it was amazing just to, just, just to see. That. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a couple chapters in. So when I finish it, don't worry, I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a message and tell you. Um, just to let you know that I finished it. I haven't finished it yet, but I will. So let, let, let me ask you. We always ask this to every guest that we get, right? Considering that the show is called the Big Break Show. I mean, I kind of, we kind of have an idea of your story now. We've talked about it for the past hour and 10 minutes, but like, what was your big break? And it could be in terms of like, when you realize it's time for me to open this business, like you said, or it could be in business life, personal, whatever it is that made you go from one point to another where I was like, wow, thanks to this, it's where I'm at now. That was my big break in life, or that was my big break in the business, right? Yeah. Well, I've, I can honestly say the big break has been doing this. I, 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 I was speaking to, to Julie George. Um, when I lived in Spain, it was July, February, 2021. And I chatted to Julie and she's obviously got a best-selling book out, Julie George, based in Australia, amazing person. And I were chatting and she said, just write the book, just write it. It's at the end of the day, it is the best business card you will, you will ever have. And it's a legacy play because now this is something that you can give to the boys when, when they get older. And I was like, I was still umming and ahhing about it. And I, and I did it. And it was the best thing and the best thing that I ever did. And I right now the opportunities and the things that are happening are because of that book. And I'm five years into the journey. And you know, this feels like a, a big break. On Thursday, I'm interviewing Mike McCallowitz for my podcast, which is like awesome for me. I'm so excited for that. And I just feel like what's happening next is going to be all because of that. So and, and the other thing that I would say is build a community before you build a business. I would not be anywhere now as in number one percent, top one percent in the podcast downloads, number one bestseller book, if it wasn't for the community behind me. And the community was built back in 2016, at time in October when I started the group up just to help. And I just came in and supported, 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 helped, help, 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 help. And now all these opportunities came of it. And, and Rafa, you're a perfect example of this. I've seen your journey from Clubhouse from last year. You just came in all the time and help, 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 got on calls with things and everything. And now I look, doing meetups and the podcast and they've got the, the, the podcast with Jesse and stuff. In your prime example of that, just go in and support and help and show up. And this is what I love about Clubhouse is that every other social media channel, you can get away by scheduling. You can get away with someone doing it for you. You know, Instagram, you can have someone post it for you. All that Facebook, you can have someone post it for you. They can create the copy. They can do all the things. But with Clubhouse, there's no hiding. If, if you are crap, you will get buried on Clubhouse, but you have to show up. You have to show what you're talking about because it's audio. It's your voice. I can't have someone put on a weird accent and do my do my voice on, on, on Clubhouse. You know what I mean? It's like, this is what I love about the app. And as much as, and I know it's sort of disappearing in terms of usability, but I feel like the people that are on there now, they get so much value because the people are sticking around. The, the best of the best are on there. And I feel like it's, it's such a good app. And I feel like there's so many of these things that has contributed to that. I would never have written this book if it wasn't for Clubhouse. So there's so many cool things to sort of take from that. Build a community, show up, be awesome, provide value, and then you build a business on the back of it. 
Yeah, man, that's awesome. I, again, man, me and you, so many similarities. I mean, if it wasn't for Clubhouse, like I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have met Jesse. I wouldn't have met you, right? Like all of this stuff. And it came from, yeah, from a place where I just wanted to give good advice and help people get started in their journey as well. So thanks for sharing that, man. My pleasure. That's true. Clubhouse, man, is really, you know, is really, is really a thing. I think it's dying down a little bit, but there's still a lot of people that are still on there. It's still... I don't think it's going to go anywhere. A lot of other companies are copying it. Facebook has something similar. Twitter, all these companies are doing doing the same thing. So, but yeah, I'm glad we met each other. I mean, Rafa, Mark. So, uh, where can we find you at, Mark? Or, or what? Actually, you know what? I'm gonna let me let me backtrack this. What can somebody do today to learn and apply? What after they're done listening to or watching this, what can somebody do today based off of what you said? The number one thing they can get jump in and do something, apply something that they learned from this this podcast. What I want everybody to do listening to this, and this is obviously I'm going to do the context that you've got a property and you've got guests that have stayed with you or they're due to stay. All you need to do, pick up your phone. Okay, you can't do an email because Airbnb don't share the email, but pick up your phone. You've got the phone number. And I want for you to text the last four guests, four little words. Do you know anyone? So do you know anyone that needs accommodation? Do you need anyone that needs a place to stay when they come to X? Do you know anyone? You can send it as a voice note if you're feeling fancy, a text message but it'll take you 10 minutes for people. And then what I want for you to do next is I want you to call the next booking that comes in, pick up the phone and call them. So whoever it is, whenever they're staying, call them up and ask them a lot of who, where, what, why, when questions. So why are you coming? What made you stay with us? What made you book us? Survey your guests, because if you truly want to build a business and a brand, then you need to start surveying your guests as soon as possible, because you need to know why they booked you. What made them click? What was it? Where did they find you? Why are they coming? And then they'll tell you if there's anything special. So it's, I'm coming for my birthday. Brilliant. Make a mental note, ask the cleaner or pop a little birthday card in saying happy birthday. Guest experience goes through the roof right there. It doesn't matter if your bed's crap, if the heating breaks, the wi fis down. By doing that little bit extra personalization, your business is already on a way for a five-star review. And as we said right at the very start, your business lives and dies in this industry on reviews. Little things like that, straight for the roof. I love it. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. That's good advice. So where can people find you? Where, how, how does somebody get a hold of you or, or follow your content or work? Where can somebody catch you? Best place to start Instagram. Everybody uses Instagram at Boostly UK. But what I want everybody to do, go to boostly.co.uk forward slash book. Go and grab this. Literally $20. I guarantee you'll get a return of investment on it. Um, it's on Amazon. It's on Audible, Kindle, print. Just head on to Amazon right now and go grab yourself a copy. I bought it the moment you posted it. Literally, the uh, moment you posted it, I was like, I'm it. buying it. You know. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll we'll put all that stuff in the show notes, everything down there. Um, Mark, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, we've been listening to you talk on Clubhouse, been sharing stages stages with you. Uh, maybe someday we'll have an event, and you can come down and, and hang out and talk at that speak would at that event. To. I would love to. I would love to get out the pond again. Actually, Mark, that would be awesome if you did because me and Jesse are thinking of doing like a mastermind somewhere, like in Napa or like somewhere cool where we can like have a couple close group of people who are like experts in this field and it would be awesome to have you dude it would be it would be an honor if you would come down here bring your family right enjoy california have you ever been to california by the way yeah man i i okay. spent a lot of time in long beach many oh, cool. many months many many months i've been all up and down the west coast loads of times nice. been in san diego tons i love california it's an amazing yeah. place dude, I, I gotta make my way to your side of the of the pond as they say right i gotta go out there <laughs> i really want to man I, you know what i want to do i want to go to oktoberfest i want to like really like just go out there and like see things and experience it so maybe uh maybe we'll meet each other at a pub out there one day <laughs> clockwork, clockwork your business and there you go <laughs> <laughs> all right really quick before we get you off man because again yeah thanks for coming on but where can they go for your training that let's let's yeah let's yeah i mean if anybody wants to find out more literally the, the, the book has got a full course attached to it for absolutely free start with there and if you feel like you, you like my job how i talk how i work and if you want to find out more once you're on my email list you'll never you never not hear from me. You know what I mean? So it's like, yo, as soon as you come into my world, I'll, you'll find me if you want to find me. That's awesome, man. Yeah. We'll make sure that we put everything in the show notes, everybody listening right now, Mark, thank you so much for being here. If this gave you guys any value at all, please like, and share this with somebody that you love, somebody that you're working with, somebody that can learn about what Mark's doing. Um, and also rank us a five-star rating would be fantastic. I sound like a, uh, my automations that come out through Airbnb and all the other platforms, <laughs> but in order for us, and as you know, Mark, you have your own podcast in order for us to continue to grow. We have to get reviews. We have to get ratings. Um, people got to like our and subscribe to our page. So 
like and share this with people that uh you know that you appreciate and love and that you want to have you know have somebody learn something i appreciate you for being here mark there's a ton of stuff that you do that as we continue to shift in this in this um you know short-term rental or midterm game booking direct seo i'm not even i don't even want to talk about seo anymore because whatever you just made me change my mind about that but there's so much there's so much opportunities in that sector i mean it, we you got to buy his book because Mark knows how to do it. He's built his business like this. This dude's been doing it since he was a kid, literally on a farm in a rural area. So hat, my hat comes off to you, my friend, even though my hair is probably all jacked up. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> but appreciate you, man. Thanks, Mark. All right, take care, everybody.